found my way to the exchange through a family friend and uh, it was in uh, 1973, I was 13 and uh, we went, the family went on the floor for the first time and it was uh, really an amazing thing. It was just, you know, the, the, the sound of all everybody trading and stuff and this was in the old grain room and uh, so then I um, came down and he hired me as a summer runner. You know, I pretty much sharpened pencils and stuff and talked with uh, conductors that used to have a little, you know, sometimes they would come down in the middle of the day and uh, have, be able to be runners and then get, catch the afternoon. Yeah, it was quite a, quite a thing on the trading floor. You know, I always tell kids, make math your friend. Uh, and uh, I went to school at night with another fellow trader. We were young guys and uh, we went to school. I went to, to Paul. And then we both finished uh, at DePaul, you know, it took us 10 years and that. And we, it was interesting because, you know, when you're growing up and that and you make a lot of money for a kid and then all of a sudden you want to quit college. <laughs> so we kind of kept each other in, uh, you know, one person would want to quit and you'd keep the other guy in. So that was my education. My first one was a mid-am membership. That was kind of like, actually, I think they used to call it the curb market. Uh, it was for little guys. And... Uh, and uh, that was like in 1980 when the uh, the metals were hopping. That's when gold, uh, silver went up to 52 bucks. And uh, and uh, then I went to the S, uh, in the S and P's for a little while, and probably around 85, and came to the board of trade in 86. Leased seats there, and then uh, I was a bond local, and um, they uh, had a, uh, a thing called the Maxi. And so then uh, after the crash which is actually kind of an interesting day. But uh, on the day of the crash, I uh, ended up getting moving up to a full seat. And uh, so that was, and how did you finance them? Uh, you know, with uh, winnings and, you know, and, and yeah, loans, that's right. Yeah, the banks would make loans on the seats, that's right. People in the neighborhood, uh, there was uh, a, one family I grew up with, the DeVitos, and they, they usually went over to the uh, CME. There was one at the Board of Trade. My kids uh, all ran uh, as summer runners. And um, yeah, you, you would bring people, and then clerks. You'd hire clerks and or somebody else from the neighborhood here. Yeah, here, he's looking for a clerk or something like that. Take computer courses. I learned code. And you know, because what you want to do is uh, computerize your brain, right? You know, each time you learn one of those hard lessons on the floor, you know, it kind of went up in your brain. But if you do it, uh, if you wrote it again, you'd write your, your, all your instructions on your algorithm. That, that's what I would do different. I'd get into coding. It was dying. Um, there, there, were no, uh, there were no more edges. They were more like time bombs. And uh, so, uh, and that was in about 08, 09. And, um, and then I, I went upstairs and uh, did some intensive uh, studies on uh, how you could control risk. Because yeah, that, it's, uh, it's like some of the rules you learn from the trading floor. Rule one, get out of losers. Rule two, get out of losers. Rule three, get out of losers. When you would get down there on the grain floor early in the morning, in the, in, in the old days, they had time clocks. And each minute, these time clocks would go off. And it would just be like a... And then you'd hear probably hundreds of them on the trading floor. And this was only when it was early because then everybody started getting in there. You know, there could always be a game going on. It didn't, you know, if you waited around or if you had any kind of uh, where you'd go over in other markets and poke around, there was always something going around, going on. Uh, very intelligent people, you know, it was, it was really honorable people too. Uh, you know, sometimes that, that, that goes, uh, gets a bad rap, but the very honorable people on the trading floor, smart, you know, where people would teach. I don't know really where you would go to learn grain trading right now, you know, other than maybe at a commercial elevator. But, you know, like what we did on the trading floor, you know, where you'd learn about deliveries or some of the other nuances in the uh, futures market. 
a lot of camaraderie on the floor. The worst part, it would bring out the worst in people, though, you know, especially when when different sides of the, the bulls and the bears were fighting it out here, you know, and then sometimes uh, it would get, uh, you know, a little bit more serious, you know, because it was money. It was money and it was competitive. So many people, I mean, there, there had to be at the height of it, there probably were about eight, I'm going to guess 8,000 people down there, you know, with, with the runners and uh, the other uh, traders. It was a sea of humanity. That was one thing when the visitors would come on because it, especially when it was busy, you know, if there was a drought or anything, anything, you know, where bonds, interest rates moving around and the sweat in there from all of those, you know, from a few thousand people in there, it was really quite, it was really quite something. You know, it was just exciting. It was just because you didn't know what you were going to go in. You just knew you loved to go in if you had a thirst for it. We could have a big winning day, you know, though, and then the cost of drinking, you know, because then you might have had a good day and all of a sudden you lost money or you scratched and you could have had a great day. One time in the Dow pit, I was uh, trading big and uh, had, uh, I had, I don't know, 350 Dows on. I mean, I was younger and I was a different man actually. And the market was rallying and I, uh, it came up and, and it was total ego. And I had to be able to show this guy, one of the index desks and then the flash him selling him 500 in front of everybody. It was a very, very foolish mistake. That was, that was really, you know, because I could have just given it to an order, a broker, order filler and uh, nobody would have known. So that was, uh, but that was my, you know, that was one of my uh, good days. 08, and it was in the wheat market and wheat was on fire. And I had done so much research that I was following a previous market and the days of the week were the same in one of the years because this was like about a, a not even a year market or something, but it was a, it was a squeeze. And, uh, and we, the wheat was expanded, expanded limits. I think it was $1.35. And we closed that day. And then the following morning, I woke up at 4.30, whatever time it was early. And I see that the market was down $1.30. And, and it was my top day. It was uh, another lesson from somebody else. Uh, Alan, if you're early, the smarter you are, the earlier you'll be. Well, I was a day off here, and I'm, then I started thinking, because I, I had my game plan in, had a, a couple 50 lots, 25 lots, and, and some of the back months right before they would go up that limit. And uh, I deviated from the plan, and it turned out this was this guy, Evan Dooley. He was a degenerate gambler that had no spec limit on at all. He had no money in his account. But in the course of the overnight trade, he had sold 150,000 of the notional wheat crop in the United States. It was about 15,000 contracts at the time. I, you know, that was, and, uh, and then they came to cover them and they kept covered them in two orders. There was nowhere to go. You know, there was, if you didn't have a stop in, there was nowhere to go. And uh, that, yeah, that particular day really kind of robbed my trading soul because you know, where you used to be fearless and you used to have an attitude, that all went out the window. I was a uh, technician. I'm a chart guy, and uh, and I've only become more of a chart guy with pattern relationships. But I would look to risk maybe say 10, 10 ticks to make you know 70 or 80. You know a trade, uh, and uh, when they go to extremes. You know, you're looking to buy extremes to the downside or sell them to the upside, uh, although nowadays that, that seems really kind of crazy, but yet you have to have a stop in. And uh, that was actually my in for a full seat. Uh, I remember coming back from lunch that day and uh, they, they traded the maxis at the time, which was like the Dow Jones. And uh, I bought a five lot and I was like immediately down I, like 5,000, I bought another five lot. And uh, before you knew it, I came back from lunch and about 10, 15 minutes later, and I had 25 of these maxis on, they were ticking about 500 points a tick. And uh, so then they started to creep back. And that was the, uh, that was in the maxi with the Blair Hull story where he came down, nobody knew who he was. I was like, who is this guy? You know, and he's over there buying all these Dow contracts because he knew, well, he made a good speculation. I was a pit bull in grains, 
And I was a pit bear in the Dow. <laughs> Both things you should not be advised to follow because 90% of the time the grains are in a bear market and 90, probably more than that in the Dow and an up market. But, uh, but we were traders, you know, we were traders and, and traders are different. So in 87, after the crash, I went in the bean pit and uh, I had an out trade. Okay, I was brand new guy in the pit. And uh, it was with a guy, Mike Friedland. His badge was Muff. Everybody called him Muffy. And the man, it was just a stand. Anyway, I came back down. I was home. I came back down. They're like, you got 100 versus 200 with this guy. I'm like, oh my goodness, because I don't know. I'm just guessing maybe you say it was $20,000 discrepancy or something like that. I came down. I asked him if he's there. He's like, yeah. Came down and I walked it through them. I had my cards and I'm like, uh, I said 100, you said 100, and then you said 200, I said 200, and then he went more. It was, we were off 100. I, and, uh, and so he looked at it, he recalled, and he's like, okay, it's good. Which meant that, you know, if it was a $20,000 out trade, we'd each have to split half of that. And he took it and it was just like, it made me so proud to be a Board of Trade member because of the integrity that these people on the floor had, these fellow, your fellow associate members. I have to go back to the 88 FBI sting operation because that's what they came down to find was illegal practices. And uh, it, it ended up turning out that trading after the bell, really with the same person that I've done business with, you and I have done business 20, 30 years, all of a sudden that became well, what turned out to be a felon. And there were legitimately, there was one guy that was like 50 bucks convicted felon. So, and that whole thing with the FBI ended up being, there was something like 69 traders and about $175,000. It was really small potatoes. And actually a Chicago cop was guilty of about 70,000 of the uh, buck 70. But uh, that was, um, you know, but I didn't really see that uh, illegal stuff. You know, people are like, yeah, what about the drugs? Nah, the drugs. I mean, there were guys that, that would coach, uh, you know, or, or go play golf every day. You know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, uh, I have good memories of floor. Be honest. You know, it, it goes a long way. Now, now we're worried about counterparty risk. But back in those days, your word was your bond. And that's how you did business. And if you were a bad guy or you wiggled out of stuff like that, People, you know, they would know, they would know. So, uh, well, when I did my stint for a few years with Paul Tudor Jones back in the early 90s, uh, what he did is he taught me how to think, or he taught us at, uh, how to think like a big guy. Okay, so I've always respected that, you know, okay, who's going to, uh, like last year, they had a, one of these Brazilian meat play, places blew out right at quarter end, you know, it was, so I, I think about the big guys uh, because the market will go for the big guy. It's just not you. Everybody thinks that the market goes for that person. Ah, that market was good, but they are going for bigger fish to fry. The market will go fry, fry bigger fish, fish than you. Tom Baldwin, because I came over in the bonds and the bonds was historic then. It was just the, 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 the pit was huge and uh, <clears throat> with the turnbuckles so people wouldn't fall out. And uh, then there was a uh, Charlie D, Francesca, uh, you know, just really great traders, and and people will try to take that away, but but uh, working in an open outcry, like I said, it keeps barbarians at the gate from the outside, as opposed to now where it might be resemble price dictation, not price discovery. We kind of always heard it was it was common, and. Uh, the, at the beginning, when those large orders would go off and there'd be no offers on the screen, and then you'd get that big jump, whatever it might be, you know, it might move five, 10% on, on a big order. And uh, so then all of a sudden you started paying attention and then the, the pit kind of uh, denigrated into going, you know, doing the ARB. And then it was like how to pick off the guys in the pit. And then, it, you know, it kind of, slowly uh, withered away. Now all of a sudden you, you weren't a big guy. You weren't, a, you weren't anybody. And uh, the, he with the fastest server and the biggest wallet takes all, leaves no prisoners, uh, is one of my little sayings here. And uh, 
So uh, we became the we became the outsider. You know, the, the news hits the outside now. Sometimes they release the news to other organizations, and uh, so you know the floor trading community was the last to know. You know, so it, it changed quite drastically.